You can date the beginning of the modern civil rights movement in several different ways. We're going to begin it with the story of the landmark Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Education and the events that led up to that decision. Uh, we need to define terms. A segregation, of course, is separation based on race, legal separation in many cases. Um, and desegregation means stopping that, uh, ending segregation based on race. Now, the civil rights movement really gained momentum in the 1950s. And we need to explain why it happened then. That's a basic task of historians. Why does something happen when it happened? Um, one, uh, part of the background was the rhetoric, the language used in defending the American role in World War II. This was a war for freedom, a war against the dictatorships, the totalitarian governments, of Hitler and Mussolini and Imperial Japan. Uh, we uh, presented ourselves uh, to the world and to Americans as a better alternative to that. And the, the way that African Americans were treated in this country was not consistent with that kind of rhetoric. The Soviets made much of this. Uh, they you, uh, put forth a lot of propaganda around the world saying, the United States is hypocritical. The United States isn't free. Look at the way they treat their black citizens. And they had a point. Uh, and those Americans who were um, heavily engaged in the Cold War and competing with the Soviets for uh, the support of people around the world uh, listened to that. And uh, they were embarrassed by it. And they wanted to uh, remedy that. That was another thing that was going on. There was also a new generation of social scientists. Uh, earlier in the century, uh, there had been the belief that uh, the races were uh, different uh, as a matter of nature, uh, that they weren't the same at all, that uh, some races were superior to others. And social scientists in this period uh, simply debunked that notion. Uh, Um, they uh, they did not uh, accept it, and they um, put forth all sorts of evidence against it. Also, the Democratic Party uh, in the North had a great need for black support. Uh, the Democratic Party in the South was uh, bitterly opposed to the Civil Rights Movement, but Northern Democrats uh, began to have a political motive for supporting it. This is a, a survey of uh, the laws affecting school segregation uh, in uh, the various regions of the country. These green states in the South, but not just in the South, uh, included a state like Oklahoma, for example, uh, required segregation by race as a matter of law. Uh, it was not optional in the public schools. The northern states were just the opposite. They prohibited segregation by race according to, uh, as a matter of law. These gray states did not take a position on it. Uh, there was not much need to. Uh, and they didn't have large black populations. And generally, they uh, allowed integration. Uh, these yellow states uh, allowed this question to be determined by local option. Each individual city or county or area within the state could make its own decision. Uh, that would be Kansas, Wyoming, uh, Arizona, and New Mexico. Now, in uh, one of those states that allowed local decision making, uh, Kansas, uh, there was a minister and a welder uh, by the name of Oliver, Oliver Brown he had three children. Uh, his eight-year-old daughter, Linda, uh, was attending a public school uh, four miles from uh, their home, uh, although there was a local public school four blocks from their home. Uh, of course, the reason she couldn't attend that one was the color of her skin. Uh, and to attend the other school, which was inferior to the, to the nearby school, 
she had to walk a long distance uh, and cross uh, a railroad track in a place that was dangerous. Oliver Brown got together with other parents and sued uh, the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And this is where the name comes from, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, the lead attorney for the plaintiffs, those who wanted to challenge segregated schools, uh, was Thurgood Marshall. He was the head of the Legal Defense Fund of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Uh, and in 1951, uh, Marshall and his uh, associates filed a lawsuit on behalf of parents uh, that included Oliver Brown and many other parents in several different states uh, in federal court based on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. More on that in a little bit. Uh, the Equal Protection Clause says this, no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Um, and Marshall argued that school segregation violated this principle of the 14th Amendment called the Equal Protection Clause. Now, the one of the central questions of the case is what did equal protection mean when it was applied to public schools? Well, the uh, interpretation of those who supported segregation was that uh, it simply meant that uh, schools uh, would have to spend equal amounts of money for black children as they spent for white children. Uh, that was not happening, but they were willing to do that if they could avoid uh, integration of the schools. Uh, the other position was that there was no such thing as separate but equal schools. And therefore, segregation of schools must end. Uh, now, this second position was the one that Marshall ended up taking. And in order to uh, prove his case, one of the key strategies was what was called the doll experiment. There were uh, young black children who were uh, presented with, uh, with pairs of dolls, one white, one black, by a social psychologist by the name of Kenneth Clark. And uh, the evidence showed overwhelmingly that they thought the white doll was the better one, the prettier one, uh, the superior one. Uh, so uh, Marshall argued that the self-image of black children was being irreparably damaged uh, by school segregation. And therefore, uh, there was no such thing as separate but equal schools. They could not be equal if they were separate. Uh, as the case was working its way through the courts, uh, the uh, Chief Justice of the United States, uh, Fred Vinson, died unexpectedly. And the new president, Dwight Eisenhower, who was inaugurated in 1953, appointed uh, a Chief Justice to take Vinson's place. Um, and that justice was uh, the Republican governor of California, Earl Warren. Uh, now, Earl Warren ended up writing the, the unanimous decision of the court uh, in the case of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, the decision prohibited segregation in the public schools. It declared that this was unconstitutional because it was not equal protection. Um, Warren's uh, political skills came, uh, came to be very important in this case. Uh, at first, it was very doubtful uh, whether uh, which side would win in the case, and uh, extremely unlikely that it could be a unanimous decision. Well, Warren worked on the other justices and convinced them that if the court were divided on this case, that would lead to a tremendous amount of conflict and he was able, through his political skills, uh, to uh, convince the other justices uh, to vote for this, some of whom would have anyway, but some would not have. Uh, 
Now, there were several earlier Supreme Court decisions that overturn that uh, put forth the principle of separate but equal. So what uh, Thurgood Marshall was trying to do was to overturn uh, a, a principle in constitutional law that had been around since 1896 in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, which we have already studied. Uh, and it put forth the idea that uh, facilities could be separate but equal. Uh, so he had to overcome that burden in order to win his case. Now, the nature of constitutional law changed a great deal between 1896 and 1954. Um, jurisprudence simply means a philosophy of law, an approach to law. Um, now, in the 19th, late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, the dominant philosophy of law was called declarative jurisprudence. Uh, later in the 20th century, sociological jurisprudence became uh, more prominent. Now, what's the difference? Well, in declarative jurisprudence, uh, the court looks at the letter of the law. Uh, does the law itself show inequality? Uh, and their answer in Plessy versus Ferguson was no, it just calls for separation. That's not the same thing as inequality. But in sociological jurisprudence, uh, the court asked the question, uh, is there inequality in the real world? Not just in, uh, on, the, on the pages of the law books, but in the real world, how does school segregation affect real people, real children? And when you apply that standard uh, to this question, the results tend to be very different from Plessy versus Ferguson. Another way to look at this is that uh, traditionalists in interpreting the Constitution focus on the original intent of the framers of the Constitution. Uh, in this case, uh, the original intent uh, question would be asked of those who wrote the 14th Amendment in the period immediately following the Civil War. Uh, and when they wrote it, there were segregated schools in Washington, D.C., uh, and they had the legal authority to change that, but they didn't. So some people concluded that, therefore, they did not intend the 14th Amendment uh, to apply to school segregation. Others argue that we have a living Constitution, that what, what those framers of the amendment were doing was setting forth a principle here, but that how we can understand that principle will depend on the nature of the society and the times in which we live. Um, what does equality mean? Uh, what does equal protection mean? Uh, well, with advances in the science of psychology, with a, a better uh, understanding of how certain things affect children, uh, we may come to realize that uh, equal protection means something that those original framers did not realize. Uh, and yet they, they set forth the principle, and we are being true to the Constitution only if we understand what it means in our society. This is not a rejection of the Constitution. The, those who favor a living Constitution argue that this is a much more accurate and faithful way to understand the Constitution. And that debate still goes on today in many, many areas. Now, um, after the Brown decision was reached in May of 1854, uh, the response was absolute opposition in the South, uh, the Deep South, that is. The border states tended to cooperate quietly, uh, but the Deep Southern states did absolutely nothing to comply with the decision. Uh, the court, so the, the school year of 1954-55 came and went, uh, and nothing had been done. So uh, a year after the decision, in 55, the Supreme Court, or, Court ordered, quote, due deliberate speed in implementing Brown versus Board. Uh, and they gave federal judges in the South the power to oversee 
this segregation. Now, they didn't have uh, a large military force behind them. That was something the president would have to call for. Uh, but uh, the court was obviously unhappy uh, with the, the uh, almost non-existent pace of change in the Deep South. The South then rebelled against the court. Alabama declared that the Brown decision was null and void because it, it violated states' rights. That was a very old uh, doctrine of nullification. Uh, it had very little to stand on, but that was what Alabama said. Georgia made it a felony, a serious crime, to spend any state funds for school desegregation. So it was a crime to follow the law as uh, put forth by the Supreme Court. Uh, some states denied any funds to school districts that complied with the Brown case. Uh, the progress uh, in desegregation was slow. Uh, in 1956, uh, 300,000 Southern black children were in desegregated schools, but two and a half million were still in segregated schools. Uh, the South issued a document it was called the Southern Manifesto, a strong statement of principles. And they, their principles, if you can call them that, were that segregation uh, must be allowed because of the idea of states' rights. Now, there were, of all the congressmen in the South, from the South, uh, 27 of them refused to sign the Southern Manifesto and every single one who refused to sign this document was defeated for re-election. This is how uh, intensely the South was opposed to this decision, uh, how much they favored maintaining the Jim Crow system. Things came to a head in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. Uh, Little Rock Central High School was scheduled to be desegregated. It was an all-white school. Uh, the governor of the state, Orville Faubus, called in the National Guard to stop nine black students from entering this school. Uh, there were mobs in front of the building. Uh, the, these, the children's uh, students uh, were not safe uh, without protection. At this point, uh, President Eisenhower, who really did not enjoy the idea of getting involved in this, nevertheless, uh, called out the uh, 101st Airborne. He sent in troops to protect these students. And the, the situation was so tense, so polarized, that each individual student had to have individual protection throughout the school day. Uh, there were soldiers within the school making sure uh, that it was safe. Uh, the next year, uh, Governor Faubus, Faubus simply shut down the public schools. He closed them all. Uh, and he was reelected, uh, showing his popularity among white voters. Of course, black voters at that time could not vote in most of the South. Some cities in Virginia uh, closed public schools entirely also. Uh, so uh, the, the progress was going to be very very uh, gradual, uh, and it would face bitter opposition. In part two, we'll look at other aspects of the civil rights movement.